Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. Markham Hislop wrote a 9,000-word article published May 14, 2019, in which he claims to debunk the work of Vivian Krauss, the researcher who spent a decade tracking the foreign funding of the various Canadian environmental groups, most of which are federally registered charities, meaning that you and I subsidize them. Hislop takes aim at what he calls Krauss's conspiracy theories on the tar sands campaign. Now, conspiracies normally take place in secret, so what if it was all out in the open? But so open and vast it would be almost impossible to connect the dots. Matthew Nisbet is a very accomplished, very prolific professor of communications at Northeastern University. He has contributed to dozens of journals and books on climate change communications, and he's been tracking this group of billionaires who've been running the Design to Win campaign for many years. In his 2011 Climate Shift document, he documents how a group of billionaire philanthropists combined forces in 2005 or so to create the Design to Win plan to fund local NGOs worldwide to push for global cap and trade systems, carbon pricing, and renewables. In 2018, he published an update showing that hundreds of millions of dollars had been spent by these green billionaires, most of whom have vested interests in renewables. They spent that money on denigrating fossil fuels, millions on demarketing coal and phasing out fossil fuels. They were pushing electric vehicles, cap and trade, carbon pricing, and renewables. We find that almost all the Climate Works partners are reported funders of the environmental groups that Vivian Krauss has researched. Her reports on funding and activities match up with the reports of Dr. Nisbet. The much larger plan was revealed in the Climate Works Podesta WikiLeaks files, where a full case study of the Design to Win plan was revealed. To cross-reference this information, one can also download the Oak Foundation's grant database online and see the many grants to Canadian ENGOs and to international ENGOs, many of whom are engaged in things like the UK Tar Sands Network or, or the efforts to denigrate Canadian oil sands product via the European Fuel Quality Directive. Who knew that the Tar Sands campaign was in fact international? Well, back in Canada, we see that in this grant from the Oak Foundation, Greenpeace planned to enact its phase-out tar sands program by driving off investors and by raising the risks of the oil sands in the minds of members of parliament. In this grant, we find that Tides was given $700,000 by the Oak Foundation to fund research on the Athabasca River quality downstream from the oil sands. That seems to have been the source of the funding for the infamous Schindler-Kelly papers that sparked a national outcry against the oil sands. We see that West Coast Environmental Law was granted money to create a legislated tanker ban, and it's noted in the grant description that this would cause the cancellation of Northern Gateway Pipeline. We find the online document of the International Funders of Indigenous People, where American Michael Marks of Corporate Ethics lead organization of the Tar Sands Campaign reports on how ENGOs in the U.S. and Canada were going to collaborate on the Rethink Alberta campaign. This was intended to smear and destroy Alberta's tourism sector and drive off industry as a place to invest. Now he explains they were all working together to block Keystone XL in order to shut down the oil sands. So, on the face of all this evidence, it's hard to see how Markham Hislop can claim there's no coordinated campaign. There obviously is. People might wonder why blocking pipelines could benefit these groups who actually want cap and trade to sell more of their vested interest renewables or to push carbon trading. The landlocking of Canadian oil is certainly a benefit to other oil exporting nations. Certainly U.S. producers benefit from our competition being pushed off the market, though it doesn't seem like U.S. oil producers are behind this campaign. It seems more likely that Canada and our economy is being squeezed to force us into carbon trading, and in fact, shortly after Minister McKenna returned from the COP21 Paris Agreement, this op-ed appeared, trading for Tidewater. In some circles, this kind of arrangement might be known as 
extortion. While Hislop makes the case, with all of his interviewees about Vivian Krause's work, that the ENGOs have only received phenomenal millions of dollars in funding from foreign entities, here we see that the Oak funded tides in Canada to set up a $30 million fund, presumably from Canadian philanthropies and corporations. We know that many banks, institutional investors who are signatory to the UNPRI and major transnational corporations have funded ENGOs to push for things that benefit their vested interests directly or indirectly. Case in point, David Suzuki Foundation, funded by the Power Corporation since 2007. David Suzuki Foundation pushed for coal phase out in Alberta, pushed the Alberta NDP government climate plan with a submission for the implementation of renewables, especially wind, and Power Corporation has a renewable subsidy. Power Corporation is building a wind farm in general Alberta. What do wind farms generate? Tradable, renewable energy certificates, integral to carbon markets. And what do they need in order to be valuable? A price on carbon. We can confirm that Vivian Krauss is certainly on the right track with her research. We have issued four reports that Robert Lyman produced independently. Robert Lyman is a former public servant and diplomat who spent decades in government in senior policy positions advising on things like the Kyoto Accord. GHG reductions in the Transport Division of Environment Canada and, and Robert expands on the scope of Vivian's work and shows us the impacts on the Canadian economy. Please read our reports. The first is Manufacturing, a Climate Crisis, which we wrote and in which we call for the accountability of foreign-funded, tax-subsidized ENGOs using West Coast environmental law as a case study. The second is Money Matters, the ENGO political advantage, where you will see the astounding volume of revenues that ENGOs have gathered compared to what our political parties have. Dark Green Money gives you a glimpse inside the Big Green funding machine. And Big Green Money shows you foreign funding for the no versus pro conventional energy in Canada. And lastly, the Green Titanic, how Big Green Money's political power was unleashed. We cannot ascribe intent or motivation to any of the individuals or groups involved, but we can see the outcome. Bill C-48, the tanker ban, killed a major pipeline project that had been approved by the NEB. Perhaps to ensure that Northern Gateway could not be revived and that Trans Mountain would be held up forever, ENGOs then went after the NEB to turn its fair and thorough, highly technical process upside down. That became the contentious Bill C-69. We know the outcome of this is that U.S. energy investment banker, PPHB, has stated in its newsletter of April 2018, Musings, that Canada has become hostile to investment. How did that happen? Over a decade of international smearing of the oil sands reputation, harassing of bankers, insurers and investors, over a decade of driving up regulatory and operational costs by the tar sands campaign and all its actors. And no one fighting back until now, until Premier Jason Kenney citing the decade of work of Vivian Krauss. Please read our reports and understand what we Canadians are up against inside our own house. And send your thanks to Vivian Krauss for her curiosity, courage, and desire to get the story straight. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. <laughs>